Lord Jesus, who compares to you? You are our God, our creator, our sustainer. You are wisdom and power. You are the one who holds all things, all of history, according to your own plan. And you humbled yourself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, that we might be brought to God. Lord, we sing these songs. Your, your people gather together and we, we say we ever love you. And we're singing what we long to be true in our hearts. And we sing with the anticipation and the confidence that one day, in your very presence, these words will be sung with no compromise, no space between what we want to want and what is reality. In the meantime, we sing with hope, with faith, with our trust in you. Lord Jesus, we ask even today that you would have your way in our hearts, that every heart here would be submitted to you in faith. We ask it for your honor, for your glory, that you may receive the reward of your suffering. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Zach Can is opening God's word for us this morning. He needs no introduction. Uh, you've heard Zach preach before. You've heard him talk about the work in Papua New Guinea. Uh, they have plane tickets September 27th to go back to Papua New Guinea. Uh, they are awaiting some paperwork, some visas for their family. And uh, so they haven't changed their tickets yet, but you can pray that those visas would come through and they'd be able to get back. And what they go back to, as you know, is a long, hard work. It is a, a tough sled to take the gospel to people who have no access to God's word. They don't have the local church. They haven't heard the gospel. And you know, because of the labors of uh, God's gracious means through our missionaries, people have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and some have believed and we just think of the words in Romans 10. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a proclaimer, a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Not everyone heard, not everyone believed when they did hear, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So Lord willing, we will send Zach and Cassidy and their family back end of this month to the Doe people in Maioro to continue to hear the gospel, to be built up in the gospel. And Zach, we would just pray for you and with you that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain, would receive the reward of his suffering. Come and open God's word for us this morning. Thank you, Smed. And thank you to the rest of the elders here at Christ Bible Church as well. I think of Ashley and Eric and Scott and Jacob and Denny and Matt, and Ben, and Omri, I'm so thankful for you guys. As I have prepared this sermon, which this morning is about false teachers, it has made me so thankful to be in a church where God's word is exalted. Because the, the antidote for false teaching is not good teachers. The antidote for false teachers, the antidote for false teaching is God's word. And how wonderful to have elders, to have shepherds who, who care for us with God's word. Um, and, and, I, and Chris, thank you for those songs that we just sang. I, there is no one like Jesus. And I hope this morning as we examine false teaching, I mean, we're going to go down in the trenches with the Lord. We're going to listen to his word and we're going to read about some really dark and disturbing things. 
And as we go down, let's not forget how wonderful the Lord Jesus is. Uh, as we turn our attention to look at false teachers, uh, let's remember that the Lord is good and is a rescuer of those who trust him. So the, the people that we work amongst in Papua New Guinea, uh, they're very deeply religious. Uh, they've got some Christian traditions. I guess when I thought about Papua New Guinea when I was going to go originally, I thought we were going to find people who were kind of a clean slate, don't really have to worry about false teaching there. Um, but when we got there, we found there are tons of Christian traditions. They do churchy things. And all these Christian traditions are couched in an animistic worldview. And they have desires for any religious mechanism that will help, that will grant them the power to get what they want. There are so many voices in Papua New Guinea vying for attention, many of them contradictory, all of them promising people what they want. And the people of Papua New Guinea, many of them are left with virtually no means to discern truth from error. Anytime a belief results in suffering, those beliefs are quickly left by the wayside and something else, something more lucrative, more promising is taken up. Anytime a new belief comes around with better promises, former ideas are discarded in the hopes that the new ones will pay out. That's what we see in Papua New Guinea. But there's really nothing new here, is there? Uh, Peter saw the same thing in the days of the Roman Empire. We see the same things today in America. Christian traditions of the past are being discarded for newer, brighter, more clever ideas. Some of them still packaged as Christianity. All of them couched in a materialistic, hedonistic, self-absorbed worldview. So how are we to discern truth from error? How prepared are you this morning to face false teaching, false teachers? Do you know enough truth to have discernment? This is one of the reasons why I love the book of 2 Peter. The letter of 2 Peter. In this letter, the Lord, through the pen of his aging and imprisoned apostle, who was about to meet his death, the Lord gives a clear and uncompromising account of truth, where it is found, and how to cling to it. In this letter, truth is clearly and carefully declared, and error is denunciated. And the stakes are laid out clearly. There is either going to be a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, and if, if you're open to Second Peter, if you have your Bible open there, uh, you can see this in verse 11. In this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's either that or there is judgment in fire and chains and darkness and bondage. The road to which is detailed in chapter 2. This letter does not describe the Christian life as one where good men can disagree with one another and we're entitled to our own interpretations on the road to figuring out our own truth and one where we all just sort of make it into the kingdom in the end. That is not the kind of letter we are looking at. Second Peter gives us rock-solid, unflinching, unchanging truth with eternal life and eternal death at stake. So today we're going to look at chapter 2 of this letter. Chapter 2. Now, why chapter 2? I have a few reasons. First, I think God's eternal perspective on false teachers is very helpful. Uh, in the same way that it helps believers to be told by an all-knowing all-powerful, all-truthful God that suffering produces eternal weighty glory, I think it's helpful to be told by that same God that behind the clean, lucrative exterior of false teachers, there is only debauchery and death to be found. Believers can persevere in suffering, knowing that suffering is not an end. And believers can beware of false teachers, knowing that 
their end is sure. Both the end of the false teachers and our end for those who are trusting in the Lord Jesus. The end is sure. Another reason for preaching chapter 2 uh, is that I am currently preparing to translate chapter, uh, Second Peter. Uh, so this study has been super helpful towards that end. So thank you for letting me use you guys as guinea pigs of sorts. And finally, another reason for preaching chapter 2 is that I've already preached through chapter 1, though most of you don't know it. Uh, I preached it a year ago during an evening service, so I realize that means that all but about 20 of you missed it. Uh, but it's recorded if you want to go find it, uh, and I'm going to review now what you need to know to be ready for chapter 2. So by way of review, Peter, in this last letter before his execution, He's encouraging a large swath of believers across the Mediterranean uh, in Asia Minor uh, to make their calling and election sure. He wants to really establish these believers in the truth that God has revealed before he dies. And to help his recipients of this letter, to help them make it through the perils of this world and into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter encourages them. He encourages them with the sufficiency of Christ. Jesus' divine power has granted to us everything we need for life and godliness. That's chapter 1, verse 3. Christ is sufficient. He is everything that we need. And then there is a certain assurance that comes from holiness, from holy living. So if faith and virtue and knowledge and self-control and compassion and love are yours and they are increasing, then you can be sure that you are, in fact, chosen and called by God. That's chapter 1, verse 10. And then lastly, he encourages these believers in chapter 1 with the sufficiency of Scripture. Peter says that this word about Jesus' great power and his imminent return, it's not a clever myth that he invented, but rather it's an eyewitness account recorded by the apostle in a prophetic word that is from God himself. It's not conjured up by mankind. This is a sure, trustworthy word. This is the word we must pay attention to until Christ comes. That's how chapter 1 ended. So those are the truths that Peter wants his readers to recall. He wants them to hold fast to that. And then without skipping a beat, he turns his attention from certain truth to pseudo-teachers, false teachers. In chapter 2, God, through the apostle Peter, prepares believers, prepares those trusting in the Lord Jesus for false teachers, for those who would teach falsehood, those who would proclaim a fake Christianity, a bad gospel. God prepares believers to face these enemies. And he does so by announcing their course ahead of time, reminding the church of God's control over such situations. False teachers don't derail God's plans. He remains perfectly able to judge and rescue. Then by exposing the character of those false teachers... They're not as unblemished as they claim to be. And finally, we'll see that God prepares us by revealing the devastating consequences of following them. So that's, that's our outline for this morning. Um, there's not a single command in chapter 2. No, no exhortation, no imperative. There's no commands. It's just one, the whole chapter is one long, dreadful description of false teachers and those who choose to follow them. And it's all designed to warn against false teachers on the one hand and to encourage the saints to stay rooted in the truths of chapter 1 on the other. So let's get started. Let's open our Bibles, if you haven't already, to 2 Peter chapter 2. And let's ask the Spirit's help as we dive into this chapter. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us as we open your word to understand what you would have us understand. God, we realize that these are your truths. They were not conjured up by the imagination of a person. God, these are your words. You carried men along by the Holy Spirit as they spoke words from you. 
May we hear them as such. May we regard them as such. May we fear you and long to follow you. God, may we not make shipwreck of faith. May we persevere to the end. And God, you promise to help us in that. You are faithful. You, were, you will surely do it. So help us, God, as we read this chapter. I pray that you would help me to speak clearly. God, there's so many truths here that have to be precisely communicated. Help me to do that well. And God, may you ultimately be glorified. May we see that there is indeed no one like you, no one above you, no one worth trusting beside you. God, may you be our love and our freedom and our hope. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll begin 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at the first three verses where God, through Peter, prepares believers to face false teachers by announcing their course beforehand. This is 2 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought, who bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So here Peter prepares believers to beware false teachers, Beware them. And he does it by announcing their entire course beforehand. And what I mean by course is their entire trajectory. He gives a summary. He says that they will arrive. They're going to be successful, but then their end is going to be destruction. So they come, and then they're going to deceive, and they're going to deceive effectively. But then they are going to perish. And it's so helpful to see a whole plan laid out like this. We get to see the end of an investment in false teaching. So he starts by announcing the arrival of the false teachers. Just as there were false prophets in the past, and there were, there are also going to be false teachers in the church. And you'll notice at the beginning of uh, verse 1 that there's a contrast here. Uh, there's the word but. Uh, and notice this contrast uh, is not a contrast between good pastors with bad ones, good teachers with bad teachers, true teachers with false teachers. Uh, to see the contrast, we have to look back at chapter 1. Uh, so if you look back at chapter 1 in verse 19, it says, uh, this is Peter writing, he says, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. We have a prophetic word. And then he goes on to describe it. In verse 21, he says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That was the work of the prophets. This is the prophecy, the prophecy that was then recorded for us in the scriptures. And then chapter 2 begins with a contrast, but there's going to be something else, something different that you need to be aware of. There were false prophets who claimed to speak for God and didn't, and they were not worth following. And in the church today, there are going to be false teachers. So we have a more sure prophetic word. And the contrast is the prophetic word with the false prophets, the false teachers. Every teacher, every teacher is held accountable by the Bible. The divinely orchestrated, spirit-breathed witness of the apostles, all teachers give an account here. So step one in dealing with false teachers is don't start in chapter two. Go back to chapter one. Know the certainty of the scriptures. Know the sufficiency of your Savior, Jesus Christ. False teachers will come, and you will be ready to face them if you know the standard, the truth to which they are held. You'll be prepared. Now, you don't have to be smarter than false teachers. You don't have to be more clever than them. You don't even have to have all the arguments to defeat them. You just have to know that God is right and keep coming back here. Keep coming back to the word. False teachers will be those whose teaching does not square with the scriptures. They may use the scriptures. Satan used the scriptures. 
They may quote it, but they don't know it. They don't believe it. They don't trust it in its entirety. They don't worship the author of it. These false teachers are going to come armed. And they come armed with what Peter describes here as destructive heresies. They're going to start spreading these clever myths that Peter mentioned in 116. He also calls these clever myths their own interpretation in uh, chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, no, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. But there are going to be people, false teachers who come, who have their own interpretation of things. They have their own clever interpretations of what they think the Bible should mean. In chapter 3, Peter calls these false teachers as those who twist the Scriptures. They use them, but they do not use them rightly. Peter then highlights where these false teachers are going to show up. He says, they arise among you. Among you. And here's a really helpful interpretive note as you handle 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, when you see Peter use the pronoun you, when he talks about you in this chapter, he is talking to believers. This letter is addressed to believers in Asia Minor. Um, this letter is for believers. It's for those of us who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you see the word you, he's describing believers. He's writing to believers. When he uses the pronouns they and them, so these are some exclusive pronouns, talking about those people over there. He is talking about those on the outside, either false teachers or those who follow them. These are false teachers who will arrive among you. They're, they're going to be among us. This is an attack from within. And Peter is very aware of attacks from the outside, from the world. That's what 1 Peter is about. 1 Peter dealt with enemies outside the church. In the 60s AD, uh, 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection about, that's when First and Second Peter were written, and it was during the time of the infamous Roman emperor Nero. He had set his whole empire against Christians against believers in Jesus. And there was a brutal persecution of believers from their neighbors and from communities. And 1 Peter sought to encourage believers in the midst of that persecution. But those were all dangers coming from the outside that believers needed to be prepared for. 2 Peter, now Peter is warning them about dangers that come from within the church. These are wolves in sheep's clothing who gather with God's flock and pretend to be something that they're not. So Peter is warning about where they are going to show up. Then he moves on uh, from their future arrival. They're going to show up to their future success. These false teachers are going to be successful. Verse 2, they will deceive many. Many will follow their sensuality. Their sensuality, that is their appeal to the appetites of the body, their diminishing of God's authority, it's winsome. It's winsome. And through it, false teachers gain a following. And their success has a, a couple of devastating effects that you can see here. One is that the road of truth is maligned. It gets a bad name. True Christianity gets a bad name because of these false teachers. Whatever their intentions were, the result of their teaching is that others sully the truth. They slander the truth. They despise the word. They question its authority. They start to mock its adherence. Another effect of their success, the success of false teachers, is that believers are exploited. Notice it, that you again in verse 3. They will exploit you. False teachers do not care for believers in Christ. Sometimes we can be tempted when we hear people tell us things that we like to hear. When people tell us perhaps that we can enjoy our salvation, you can enjoy certainty that you will be in the kingdom of God and you can enjoy your sin too. Your pleasures, they're all right. You can serve God and you can serve money. You can serve God and you can serve your lusts. When we hear messages like that, we can be tempted to think, man, this teacher, they really like me. They love me. They care for us, but they don't. They don't. Those teachers are deceived, and, it, and at, the, at the root, they are greedy for their own gain. It's in greed that they exploit you. 
And finally, we see the end of their trajectory and its destruction for false teachers. Verse 1 and 3 make it clear that their condemnation is not idly sitting by, ignoring their wrongs. Their judgment is not sleeping. Their judgment will come swiftly. Lest we be tempted with their seemingly harmless opinions or be drawn in by their apparent success. When you see a ministry and it's got a massive following, that is no indication that what they are teaching is true. We are left here with the reality that all false teachers give an account on the last day. An account of every careless word that they've taught. And again, no command here, just description. And how can you miss this first warning and encouragement? All false teachers meet their proper end. And the whole next section that we're going to look at now is an assurance of their judgment. An assurance of their judgment and of our safety if we are in Christ. Peter continues with a reminder of God's right and power to punish his enemies and to rescue his friends. So this brings us to the next part of this chapter. God, through Peter, prepares believers to face false teachers by recalling God's control. This is 2 Peter 2, verses 4 to 10. And in the Greek, this is all just one long sentence. One long sentence. Here it goes. Ready? For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell committing them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ash, he condemned, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for... As that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. If all that is true, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. End of the sentence. So Peter, with certainty, has said that false teachers will be destroyed, their judgment does not sleep, and here Peter reminds his readers of how we know this to be true. God has never been intimidated by any of his rivals. God has never been intimidated by Satan and his schemes or the arrival of new enemies throughout the millennia. God has faced fallen angels he has faced rebellious people before and he has conquered all of them. He is in control. In verses 4 to 10, God is the actor here. God is the actor. These are all his actions. And the rebels and the righteous in these verses are the recipients of God's actions. God is in control and everyone else, every proud enemy, every suffering friend is known and dealt with properly by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I mean, do you see how this might prepare believers for facing false teachers? This is incredibly encouraging. In verse 4, we see that God is in control over angels. God is in control of angels. God did not spare angels when they sinned. Here, Peter is referring to the opening verses of the flood account in Genesis 6, where the sons of God go into the daughters of men to produce a giant and violent and destructive offspring. Uh, Peter and Jude, um, as well as some non-canonical Jewish religious literature too, all understand the sons of God there to be fallen angels who at that point in history overstepped a boundary that had been set by God. They overstepped it in an act of brutal rebellion against what God was doing. They wanted to fill the world with their image and eradicate mankind, eradicate the possibility of a promised offspring that would come and crush the head of the serpent. That's what they are about. That's massive rebellion. But far from being threatened, God simply acts 
justly. He did not spare them. God knows how to deal with those who are undoubtedly his most powerful enemies. They cannot escape. They cannot win. And their end is inevitable. And notice too here in this first description in uh, verse 4. Notice too there's no exceptions listed here. There's no exceptions. As we move forward, we're going to find that when God floods the ancient world and when he reduces Sodom and Gomorrah to ash, there is a small remnant of mankind that is rescued. There is no rescue here. Angels find no such mercy. There is no savior for them. When faced with dangerous false teachers, this kind of control that we see the Lord have, this is, this is encouraging. In verse 5, we see that God is in control of the ancient world, was in control of the ancient world. God did not spare the ancient world that listened to Satan's lies, embraced Satan's henchmen. They were wiped out off the face of the earth with a flood. God is in control. Even when the whole world, the whole world, I don't know how many millions of people were around at that time, but the whole world, minus eight people, were in outright rebellion against their maker. But God's hands are not tied. He rules. He can save whom he desires to save and destroy whom he desires to destroy. Righteous Noah and his family are saved, the rest drowned. Though Satan had deceived and blinded almost the entire human race, God was still in control and Satan did not win. In the face of false teachers, that too is comforting. And finally, we can see that God is in control of the present world as well. And our world is no better than the ancient one. Morally speaking, mankind is no different. Just because this world has not been destroyed yet does not mean that it is safer than angelic host or the ancient world. And to show this, God, in the days of Abraham and Lot, destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone from heaven. He reduced those cities to ash, not because all the other cities of the day were better off or not equally deserving of judgment, but he did it to put forward an example, Peter says. They are an example, a warning to this world and all generations of the unrighteous, including those in our day. Only Lot and his daughters survived the judgment of those cities and only because God sent divine messengers to drag them out. God is in control. And this warning from Sodom and Gomorrah, it still stands. I know it's been 4,000 years since this event and we've kind of relegated Sodom and Gomorrah to what we call ancient history. But Peter says the ancient world was destroyed by a flood. The example presently for us, Sodom and Gomorrah. You want to know the end of false teachers? You want to know the end of rebellion against God? Just read the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the end. That's where it's going. And this warning still stands. I mean, Peter even writes, if you look over at chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, he writes, The earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of the Lord, that by means of these, the world that then existed, the ancient world, was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist, the present world, are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. So the warning still stands. God is in control, and he still is, and that is comforting for those who trust in the Lord Jesus. And that is Peter's conclusion here. Look at verses 9 and 10. If God did not spare angels, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah and his family, if God reduced Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, but saved Lot and his daughters, then God knows. God knows God's knowledge, not our own, should be the basis of our hope to survive Satan's schemes and false teachers. God God knows how to judge and he knows how to spare. God knows whom to judge and whom to spare. Believers, we can have confidence in God when faced with false teaching in all of its forms. Everything that's out there that parades as Christianity, and there's so much of it, 
There's so much of it. It shows up on TV. It shows up in books that we read. It, it shows up in the pews as we grumble and talk to one another and share our destructive opinions with one another. This, this is dangerous stuff. And I was just talking to, to Chris this morning. It shows up in worship music. Things that parade as Christian songs. There is heresy there worth avoiding. And it's dangerous. But there's hope here. If we will trust in the Lord Jesus, if we remember that he is in control of all ends, that he knows how to spare, he knows how to judge, we can have confidence. And then Peter brings further specificity to the unrighteous who are going to receive God's judgment. He's, in essence, introducing the next section that we're about to look at. God knows how to keep the unrighteous right where he wants them until the day of judgment, the day of reckoning. And just so you know who he's talking about when he speaks about the unrighteous, he defines them further. Peter writes, specifically, especially, I am writing about those who indulge in the desires of the flesh and despise authority. Do you see that there in verse 10? This is the definition of an unrighteous person. And false teachers are just unrighteous people who have made their way into the church among you. They have not repented, and they have started preaching, started teaching, started spreading modified gospels. And they need to be exposed. And so that's where Peter heads next, to an expose of false teachers. He's going to put their defiling indulgence in pleasure and their defiant hatred of authority and their delusion on display for all to see. And false teachers do not like these descriptions. False teachers love clean images, respectable positions where they can be seen as wise and clever and helpful. Maybe the only insider who has the secret track on truth. Come follow me. I'm worth following. They do not want to be exposed for who they actually are. But Peter's going to do that. And he's going to do that by giving them some titles. And you're going to see that as I read through it. Uh, in verse 10, he's going to call them bold and willful. You, you get this combination of titles that he puts on them. Bold and willful. Then in verse uh, 13, you're going to see he calls them blots and blemishes. And then he goes on to describe that a little bit. And then in verse 14, he calls them accursed children. Cursed people. And he goes on to describe that a little bit. And so we're going to look at those. Uh, but first, let's, let's read 2 Peter 2. This is the second half of verse 10 going on through verse 16. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, they do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational creature, uh, animals, creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed, they're blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, and they will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong is the wage for wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained that prophet's madness. So here, Peter is exposing the character of the false teachers, exposing their character, taking away the clean, lucrative, flashy facade and showing us, showing believers who they really are. And his first exposure of false teachers is that they are bold and willful. They are sure of themselves and seemingly not afraid. They are defiant of authority, of powers both earthly and cosmic. So much so that Peter says they blaspheme glories. They blaspheme glories. That is, they are deriding, belittling creatures, plural, glories, creatures that are glorious. 
And while I believe the present context is enough to lead us to conclude that these glorious ones are fallen angels, uh, I'm not going to take the time to do that. Uh, The parallel passage in Jude verse 8 uh, just comes out and says it, and it's really clear. So I'm going to use Jude 8 and 9 as a shortcut. Just listen to this. This is Jude 8 and 9. Yet in like manner, these people, again, speaking of false prophets, these people blaspheme the glorious ones. Contrast to that. But Michael the archangel, was contend- when he was contending and disputing with the devil, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So these false teachers are blaspheming glorious ones, ones that Michael the archangel will not blaspheme. And the one mentioned here is he was contending with the devil. So false teachers are blaspheming ones that even the archangel Michael won't speak against. Angels leave the judgment of Satan and demons to their maker, to the Lord, as should we. And we've already seen previously that the Lord is capable of handling fallen angels. He is capable of it. He knows what to do. False teachers, on the other hand, don't. And this is so fascinating. False teachers blaspheme fallen angels. They drag the name of fallen angels through the mud. What does that mean? I think it's They think they are stronger than Satan, that they know better than Satan. Perhaps they think that Satan is not real. That's one way way to blaspheme someone. Pretend they don't exist. Perhaps they think they have Satan conquered or cornered. Or perhaps they think they have authority over demons on their own. Or perhaps they think they have the power to overcome idols in their lives. We all have idols in our lives, things that we love. And the Bible says that behind the idols that we worship are demons. And so when people come in among us and they say, oh yeah, I'm not not enslaved to this sin anymore. And they are, they're just blaspheming. They are claiming to have power that they don't. To think you are free when you are actually a slave, that's just the epitome of foolishness. And that's how, peop- uh, that's how Peter describes them. They're fools. Far from being enlightened teachers that they want to be seen as, he describes them as irrational creatures meant for capture and killing. And just like such beasts are corralled and killed, so too false teachers will be corralled and killed on the last day. They will be destroyed And not only are false teachers defiant of authority, but they are also defiled indeed. The next set of descriptors that we get from Peter is that they are blots and blemishes. So visual evidence. The blots and blemishes, these were visual evidences of being unclean in the Old Testament. False teachers are defiled. And Peter gives some strands of evidence to support this claim each highlighting their indulgence in bodily pleasure. So this is, they're they're defiled indeed. They're blots and blemishes. They are not as clean as they propose to be. Uh, He says they are loving their deceptions. They love their deceptions. They know they're sinning. They're sinning and they feel like they're getting away with it. They are enjoying their sin, pursuing their sin. And then they come and they sit here among us and we don't know. And they think that is a hoot. They love that. They love that they are getting away with their deceptions. They are sitting there having eyes full of adultery, eyes insatiable for sin. They're not looking for opportunities to serve others. Rather, they're looking for ways to serve themselves. And as sensual people, they are actively looking for ways to fulfill the desires of their body. And whether or not these false teachers actually commit adultery or not, according to Jesus, the act has already taken place in the heart. Next, he says that they're enticing or exploiting unsteady souls. And I, I do think it's interesting that false teachers, I'm not sure if this is true across the board, but false teachers, those speaking falsehood, tend to pick and choose with whom they speak. They love a good audience who will be swayed by their plausible arguments. They look for other disgruntled people 
to share their opinions with. They don't want to be confronted by someone who knows the word. They want the praise of man. They want the riches of the world. They want heaven on the last day. They're not going to endure those who hold them accountable to the word. They like preaching their opinions to those who are unsteady in soul, not anchored to God's word and truth. And it also says they have hearts trained in greed, just another evidence that they are defiled indeed. False teachers love themselves. Jesus commanded his disciples to lead by being servants of others, being slaves, making yourself the least, finding ways to to encourage and help others. False teachers are out for themselves. They are cursed. And this leads us to the last description of false teachers. They're not only defiant of authority, defiled indeed, but they are deluded as to the way of righteousness. False teachers are lost. They have gone off the rails. They have followed Balaam. This is verse uh, 15 and following. Balaam is not a guy you want to follow. Like a madman, it says, he loved the wages of unrighteousness. And this is really interesting. Uh, This is verse uh, 15. Um, Balaam loved gain from wrongdoing. Now, that is the exact same expression as what was said in verse, at, at the beginning of verse 13. Suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing. Wage of wrongdoing, wages uh, or gain from wrongdoing, that's the same expression. Now, in verse 13, we found out suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing. What's the reward of wrongdoing? It's you just receive the reward of wrongdoing. This is not to say that God repays people wrongly or God does any wrongdoing or that you get something wrong for wrongdoing. This is to say that God's judgment of them is just. You will receive the proper reward of unrighteousness. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. But fools don't see that, do they? False teachers don't see that. They think they're getting what they want. They're think, they think they're getting away with sin. They feel like they're winning. They are pleased with their deceptions. But they're not. They are deluded. They are fools. Balaam and those who follow him are foolish. Look at how the Lord gave a ridiculous rebuke to a ridiculous person. A speechless beast, a donkey, was given a human voice to keep Balaam's madness in check. Here we see that God will likewise dishonor all those who follow Balaam's road. If, if you love to deceive, if, if you love the reward that comes from your unrighteousness, if, if you love the loot that comes from stealing, the thrill that comes from something illicit that you're hiding, if you delight in your deceptions. If you love the reward of wrongdoing and you think those are the rewards of wrongdoing, then you are a fool because the wages of wrongdoing are devastating. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22, on the last day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do many mighty works in your name? And what is Jesus, how does Jesus reply? He says, And then I will declare to them, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Lawlessness, thinking there's no law, thinking we're not held accountable to what we do. Departure from Jesus is the pay for lawlessness. Being excluded from life, excluded from the kingdom, that is the pay for lawlessness. Like Balaam, false teachers are fools. They're mad to follow this road. And we would be mad too to follow them. And so Peter ends this chapter with a warning, not a command, but a warning of the consequences of following false teachers. So God, through Peter, prepares believers to face false teachers by revealing clearly the consequences of following them. This is 2 Peter 2, 17 through 22. These, that is the false teachers, are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. 
For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then are again entangled in them and overcome, then the last state has become worse for them than the first. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. So verse 17 begins with a declaration that the false teachers are dangerous. They are dangerous to those who desire to follow the narrow road. They claim to have life-giving water. They claim to have the truth that people need to survive, but they have none of that. They are like a spring with no water. They are like a mist that's driven along by the wind. And living in a desert, I think we can appreciate these metaphors, can't we? We've all seen those rains, those mists that come. You see the dark clouds on the horizon, and then that hot, blow dryer wind just pushes it across and we're hoping for reservoirs filled with water and watered plants and cooler weather and all we're left with is sticky heat and dirty cars. Or perhaps you've spent some time in the in the desert in the summer heat on those hot sands and seen those gloriously blue mirages on the sand. If your thirst drove you towards those illusions of water, they would be the end of you. Those mirages, while indeed providing some sense of hope if you're stuck in Death Valley, they don't produce life. They are dangerous. They are waterless springs, and in like manner, false teachers will deceive you and destroy you. That's why the utter gloom of darkness is reserved for them. So they're deceiving. They, they look like they have true water. They look like they have life, but they don't. Then in verses 18 and 19, Peter tells us about the tools and the targets of false teachers. They have flashy proposals, loud boasts, sensual offerings. Maybe they say things like the ancient serpent who said, you won't surely die, you'll be like God. They loudly tell people what they want to hear. They allow people to do what they want to do. And their targets are like what we saw before. These are people who have barely escaped from those who live in error. That is, there are people in the world who see what a mess it is. They see some of the error, the flaws. They want hope, so they come to church, and it's in that context that they find false teachers who offer them, get this, eternal life, you can have the eternal life described in church and you can continue to enjoy the sins and the idols that you have already enjoyed. And many, remember verse two, many people find that message delightful. They've seen some of the error in the world and they're like, ugh, we don't like that. So they come to church, but their hearts are unchanged. They're like that dog that returns to its vomit. The dog hasn't changed. The dog left, went away, thought it became something new, but it goes right back right back to that muck. The pig after washing herself, same thing, right back to that mire. That animal is still unclean. Hasn't changed. If anything, now the situation is worse. What are the con what's the condition of those who follow false teachers? It's worse than it was before. It's not good. Peter's assessment is this. Those that follow false teachers are worse off than before. If these escapees leave the worries and cares and errors of the world, because some good news of Christ has reached their ears, they've heard some truth from the Bible, and then they go back and are ensnared by their same idolatries, their future punishment is now going to be worse than if they had simply just remained ignorant and lost in the world. Don't think that proximity to Christianity is going to help you 
unless you repent and in faith trust in the one God has sent. Proximity to Christianity will actually do the opposite if you don't repent. It will hurt you eternally. And that is the sobering end of chapter 2. But thankfully not the end of the letter. And I'm not going to preach chapter 3 this morning. Maybe I'll get to it in a few years when I'm back on furlough. But by way of application, I think some encouragement is in order. After hearing of all the judgment and consequences surrounding false teachers, I doubt there is a single rational soul here who aspires to be a false teacher or follow one. So let's just consider some practical wisdom to avoid false teachers. And I'll make this quick. Three exhortations for you. And these exhortations flow from one to another. First, read and trust God's word. Read and trust God's word. And there, in God's word, find that God knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Come meet the Lord. Meet King Jesus, who is able to save people from their sins. He is able to save the ungodly. He is able to rescue even false teachers who turn and repent and leave their false teaching behind. And then, with that hope that you have from Jesus Christ, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. As I was preparing this sermon, I often thought of Martin Luther, who faced so many heresies and false teachers in his day. I mean, it seems when you read accounts of him that he had just the whole world and all the powers that be stacked against him. And in the face of many powerful enemies, Martin Luther found solace in the superior power of God and his Savior, Jesus Christ, and his true word that he had provided. And Martin Luther, in confidence in the truth of the scriptures, wrote these words. This is a hymn you know well. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, Satan, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. And that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to those earthly powers, this word abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. And then he ends, what were our Christians to do? Do we still need to fight for ourselves in this life and our pleasures? No, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Friends, I am going to miss you. Press on in the Lord. Cling to his word. Don't be deceived by the false teaching in this, in this world. And Lord willing, if the Lord tarries and I survive, maybe I'll come back and preach chapter 3 in a few years. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for these truths that we see in 2 Peter chapter 2. God, thank you for the warning. Thank you for this horrifying description. God, may it, may it help us all to hate false teaching, to hate any gospel that promises something that you have not promised, and to love all the promises that you have, in fact, given. God, may it help us to love Jesus more. God, may you make your sun shine all the more brightly because of passages like this, and may we find all our hope for the future life in him. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.